Lot is our enemy. And um, we have Joe Sacco. an incredibly um, distinguished panel of people here that I'm absolutely thrilled to um, be able to talk to here uh, today at SPX on the um, what we're celebrating is the 40th anniversary of Fantagraphics books. Um, everyone here in this room should Thank know you. who everybody is on this stage, so I'm, I'm not even going to um, go through that because the clock is ticking here. And uh, my name, but of course I'll introduce myself. I, my name is John Kelly. I am the executive director at the Museum, which is Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I encourage everyone to come down and say hi uh, if, if you're in Pittsburgh. But, it's um, a really cute museum. I've been there. <laughs> cute is accurate because it is small, but um, <laughs> um, it is. Thank you, Trina. Um, but let's let's. Uh, Let's start off here, uh, and obviously let's, let's go to Gary. And um, so Gary, it's, it's the mid 70s, and you have been publishing some comic zines and um, running MetroCon here in um, the DC area. And yeah, I grew up here. Doing, of all things, um, doing rock and roll. Um, <laughs> um, uh, in a rock and roll publication and promotion and stuff. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna first start here by reading, I don't know if anyone is familiar with uh -oh. this publication um, oh my God. from <laughs> 1990s, um, Peter Bag and Helena Harvelitz um, put together this uh, zine on the Seattle comic scene in 93. And um, uh, there's, a, there's a thing in here written by- It's gonna be a grim trek through memory lane here. <laughs> Kim Thompson, like Kim Thompson, wrote a uh, 10 things I don't know, I know about Gary Groff that he probably didn't want you to know, but it's too late now. And um, included in there was Gary's hard rock collection of albums consists of everything ever committed to vinyl by Elton John and Carly Simon. Um, yet you decided Carly Simon to- Simon, I still stand by. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, your judgment was to go into a career of um, rock and roll <laughs> at that time, which... Uh, well, that was purely opportunistic. What, um, you're trying, I'm, to, get, you're trying I'm to get chicks, to, right? What's that? You're trying to get girls. No, I was trying to, I was trying to make money so we could start a publishing company. Um, I'll, try to, I'll try to keep this to a minimum because I want, I want the cartoonist to talk as much as possible. But my, my um, partner at the time, Mike Catcher and I, we wanted to start a publishing company. It was 1975. We were um, 19, and um, the way we thought we, well, we needed money to start a publishing company, or so we thought. And so the way we thought we could make money is because I had put on conventions here in the Washington, D.C. area, comic conventions. I knew how to put on a convention. And so we thought if a comics convention could sort of uh, break even, a rock and roll convention, because rock and roll is so much more popular than comics, could make a lot of money. So we literally spent a year putting together a rock and roll convention. It was held at the Shoreham Hotel here in Washington. And um, we, 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 we got guest speakers, we got uh, local bands to play, we had a big dealer's room that was full of memorabilia and collectibles. Um, we got Henry S. Thompson to come and speak at the convention. And the convention was a complete disaster. Um, not only did we not make money, we, we, we thought we would make, you know, we were anticipating, okay, if 10,000 people came, we'd make this much money. If 8,000 people came, we'd make this much money. And um, we thought we'd just make a minimum of something like, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 dollars, and then we would start a publishing company. And um, not enough people came. We not only made no money, we made negative money. So then I just had to get a job and pay back all the money that we borrowed from friends and relatives and, and uh, people we owed money to. And uh, the only thing that came out of the convention was that we started a rock and roll um, magazine called Sounds Fine. It was a collector's magazine. And neither one of us had that much interest in rock, um, but we were interested in publishing and we were interested in putting together a magazine, just editorially and physically assembling a magazine. That's just what we wanted to do. So about a year after we did that, um, that was held in 1975 in July, and then in 1976, we published the first issue of the Comics Journal, which was called the Nostalgia Journal. 
And we took that over from, uh, from a group of people who were publishing it in Texas. We started publishing it with the 27th issue. We transformed it into a magazine, uh, a more serious magazine devoted um, primarily to comic books. It was more of a nostalgia um, newspaper. We changed the focus to comic books because that's what we knew about and that's what we cared about. And what we wanted to do was to create a magazine that imposed serious critical standards and serious journalism on comics, the medium, and the industry. And let me see if I can paint a quick portrait of comics in 1976. This was one of the most dismal periods in the history of comics. Uh, underground comics were, um, you know, had deteriorated to the extent that there were only a handful of them being published at that time. There were only a handful of you know, artists who were really active. In 1976, um, the underground publishers just weren't publishing what they were in 1970, 71, 72, 73. Mainstream comics had hit an absolute low. You know, there, 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 were, there were always high points throughout the history of mainstream comics. You know, you had EC Comics, you had Carl Barks, you had John Stanley, you had Lee and Kirby in the 60s. This was just one of the most dismal periods in mainstream comics. There were virtually no underground or alternative comics being published. From like 1976 to about 1971, there was just very little being done. Um, and so, of course, we decided to start a critical magazine exactly at that time. So the only thing to do was to criticize what was being done. And uh, we just, every month, we published the magazine about 10 times a year. And every single month, we just hammered comics. <laughs> we just hammered what was being produced. We did publish interviews with cartoonists that we admired and respected. You know, people like, like Jack Jackson. Um, I think we interviewed you probably in that period. And so we, we, we sought out cartoonists that we admired, but most of, most of the magazine was just devoted to hammering the comics industry. I mean, every month, month in and month out, uh, we would publish contentious interviews with people who were, you know, producing the comics. And I was thinking about this, and I, don't, I mean, I don't know when, you know, people on the panel started reading the comics journal, but um, thinking back on it, I mean, I started the journal when I was 21, so, and almost everybody in the comic book industry was, were middle-aged people, mostly middle-aged men. I mean, there were people in their 40s, 50s, 60s. I was just 21-year-old telling them basically that everything they were doing was wrong, <laughs> which is kind of amazing in retrospect, um, but I had no qualms about doing that. So then, I mean, so that was a really lousy period. And then in 1981, um, Raw and Weirdo started being published. And I think we published Jack Jackson's Los Tejanos graphic novel in 1981. And then in 1982, we published, you know, what I consider to be our flagship comic, Love and Rockets. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the okay. capital history. Of Okay, now we just went from having um, 90 seconds for each panel to be able to talk um, <laughs> to about 30. So um, I'm gonna pull this out and um, start this clock ticking. But um, Trina, do you wanna talk about, um, I, I know it's probably like the mid 70s or something, you met Gary at a convention in, in New York and, and what, maybe just contrast what the Comics Journal was like compared to the other um, things that were covering the industry at that time. Just, well, just to actually, put it into context. I had never read the Comics Journal uh, until Even better. Gary <laughs> interviewed me. Um, and then he started si sending me the Comics Journal. I was, suddenly I was on the comp list. And so I read it and it was, you know, it was different. There was another publication, another major publication called the Comics Buyer's Guide. But it was more like puff pieces for mainstream comics. So the Comics Journal was different. And that was good because I really hated mainstream comics. I uh, hated superheroes. I still hate superheroes. <laughs> um, and, and we hated the comics buyers good. <laughs> <laughs> so, by the way, how did you know that he interviewed me? And in, I met him at a convention. How do you know all this? Um, I, I got the comps for the, um, <laughs> the history of the. Um, well, I just knew. <laughs> was it 76? 77? 77, 76. maybe. Well, something like that, yeah. yeah. 
Right. Right. And when yeah. I interview you, yeah. And this this college <laughs> kid, you know, he says I want to interview for the comics uh, journal. I, I thought, well, it's this a fanzine, you know. And we're talking, and at some point, I asked him what he did for a living, and he said, this is how I make my living. <laughs> and I was like, you're kidding, you know. I didn't make my living on comics, um, so you know. It was like a living. A living. Here's how I make my living. Um, but I was. I was amazed and delighted and, uh, you know, <clears throat> aside from the occasional tiff, we've been friends ever since. <laughs> um, so, so um, Gilbert and Beto, um, I wouldn't think of um, Gary being particularly punk rock, but... Um, <laughs> Well, the comics journal was. The comics journal was, right? And if you actually, if you go back and you look at the history, the way that they were, they were totally DIY and, and um, sneaking into office buildings and using um, typesetting machinery and, and <laughs> somehow not getting arrested doing this and completely doing it on the fly while working, you know, crappy temp jobs and stuff like that. There was a real punk aesthetic to it, but it was, I guess, sort of by happenstance. Which I didn't know guys, at the time was punk, but yeah. Whatever. Yeah, maybe. But um, it, it, it's, it's, it just seems so fitting now looking back, you know, 35 years later or whatever that, that the first, you know, um, title that, that really cemented um, Fantagraphics as a, as a comics publishing company was Love and Rockets, which, you know, which, well, I wouldn't say it was a, a punk comic. It, it yes. certainly, um, it had that aesthetic, and, and you know that it was you know imbued throughout it, and um, it's what attracted me and, and a lot of my, my friends to it at the time. Um, you now, my understanding is that you just you did your first self-published issue of, of Love and Rockets, and then sent it out, and, and um, then you got a, a letter back from from Gary. That's it. There you go. <laughs> okay. uh, how, what was the date? What year was that? 81. 81, that's what I thought. I remember sitting by a swimming pool reading it and whoa, this is amazing. You know, you say punk, but the difference between Love and Rockets and the other punk is that it was so well drawn. Yeah, it was. Our influences were like a mainstream comics. Let's be forget. Undergrounds that had so much freedom and so much experimentation. And then our love for rock and roll was 70s and then eventually punk. So that was all combined. It's in uh, the comics journal because I just got I just got it unsolicited in the mail. And I pulled it out, you know, I opened the package and opened it up, and read it, and I wrote it. Might be, you know, I was thinking it might be the first positive re review I wrote in the comics journal. <laughs> <laughs> and I send it to them only to get free advertising because we couldn't afford to add, but then on the comics buyers guide, so I thought, well, if I got a review, yeah, and people But for you, Gary, was it was it did it just sort of um, put together everything that you had been searching for that you were wishing that could be in existence in comics? Well, I mean, you know, it's so I mean, it's so weird to talk about that time now because I mean, the undergrounds were its own thing, 
And I don't know, what I was envisioning in comics was something something else, like maybe the next step or something beyond what undergrounds were. And, and undergrounds were an essential part of the history of comics because it just liberated comics from what they had been. Um, but Love and Rockets, so we were trying, we were sort of in a way, I mean, there was nothing, there was nothing there that represented what we were striving for in the comics medium. And when Rev Love and Rockets landed on the doorstep, it was just like, you know, that we, you know, something we had willed into existence, like this is what we were thinking about, you know, this is the kind of comics that dealt with life in a naturalistic way in the comics form. There just had been nothing like it. It was just so fresh at that period. Um, and that's why I was so ecstatic and, you know, I wrote this review about it that was just sure. ecstatic. Sure. So, um, so Drew, um, you've now published nine books, I believe, um, with, with Fantagraphics. The, the, the first was... Yeah, um, somehow nine books, that's right. Um, and I, I'll, well, I'll cut back to 1981 when I was doing work for Raw, Art Spiegelman's Raw, and Robert Crumb's Weirdo. So Gary, of course, only gave negative reviews back then. So of course he gave a <laughs> negative review, kind of negative to Raw, but praising it in a way. But he pissed on my piece, which was about uh, African-American uh, arriving in Mayberry all of a sudden. So cut to 1985 and I get a phone call from a guy named Gary Groth saying, hey, uh, I'd love to publish an anthology of your work. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, isn't this the same guy who pissed on my work just a couple of years earlier? It's like, I'm not going to bring that up, but you know, I like this guy. He's got integrity. He, he, didn't be, he doesn't even like my work, but he wants to do an anthology. <laughs> <laughs> so I think my book and a book by Rick Geary were the first actual books that Fanographics did, if I'm not mistaken. My book with, with Shemp Howard on the cover in 1985, Person mm -hmm. Living or Dead. So right. that's, my, that's my history with Fantagraphics at the beginning, anyway. That sounds right. But I wanted to say one other thing. I used to read the comics buyer's guide just for the photos of Don Thompson. That's kind of <laughs> a, <laughs> Nothing else. That's a, kind of an inside. Reference. Yeah. You don't know how cool it is. I still have those photo clippings. But that's, that's an inside joke. But the thing, OK, just to describe Don Thompson, he looked like the mayor of the Munchkin City. <laughs> yeah, you, Dan has drawn Don Thompson. In, uh, never have. No? no, no I had, it wasn't him? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, it's I won't ask him. Okay. It's, it's not too late. Um, but uh, so, uh, Dan, you were. Um, oh, Carol. Well, <laughs> we're just jumping around. All right, all right. I'll oh. tell you how I got involved with this bunch, okay? I was at a con in 1988, and there were these goofy guys in a motel room just tearing the place to hell. <laughs> And I said, oh, and they said, you're a fanographist. I said, oh, you want to publish some shit of mine? Yeah, OK. That's how it went. <laughs> I remember that. Do you remember that? Yeah. It was like crazy. I think that was my Nothing home. changes. <laughs> was that your home? Yeah. It was like, who are these kids? This is like weird. We were weird. <laughs> but you've, is this, this you've... how publishing happens? You go to somebody's room, and they're just like fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> But um, now it's, it's like 28 years? I've been with them a long time. A long time, a long, long yes. time, yeah, yeah. Um, and Dan, so have you. you um, Going in order. <laughs> um, what were you, like, Born. drawing for Cracked um, in, uh, around that time? And then, and then um, yes. doing, <laughs> then Lloyd Llewellyn came out. Can you, like, go, walk through, like, what was your first experience meeting with, it, this seems to be a theme. So, so what was your first experience meeting with the Fanographics panel? Well, and, and was I it, it, it all ex what you were expecting? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I had been a, involved in comics enough to know to expect these kind of guys. <laughs> but, um, I, when I, I was working for Cracked when I was, I don't know, 22 years old, 23 years old, and I, uh, and I was trying to do other work. I was trying to get work as like a magazine illustrator in New York. And I would take out my little portfolio of fake illustrations every day to, to all the big magazines. And I'd come back the next day and I could tell they hadn't even looked at what I had left them. And it was just this really disheartening, awful way to try to, to, try to you know, make your way in the world of, of New York publishing. So I, to, sort of to keep myself sane, I thought, I should do a comic strip, like something that I really want to do, you know, just for fun. 
and I remember just like, huh, what should I do? And I remember thinking like, oh, I should come up with a character. And then I thought like, well, how about like a Superman character that's got a lot of L's in their name, like Lex Luthor or Lana Lang. And I was like, how about Lloyd Llewellyn? That would be the, old, you know, and that was literally the extent of the thought I put into it. <laughs> and then I sat down and wrote the story in like under an hour. And then I spent the next like six months slowly <laughs> drawing it. And when I was done, I thought like, well, what the hell am I going to do with this? And so I, I hadn't even like paid attention to what was going on in comics. And so I went down to the comic store and I started looking through stuff. And I thought, well, here's here's a, you know here's this company, Fantagraphics. I'll send them this color th thing I had. You know, it was all it wasn't like Xeroxes. It was like the originals in cell vinyl color. And I I sent it to Fantagraphics, and I never heard anything for like three weeks. And uh, and then one day, like on a Sunday afternoon. And all I was hoping for was like for the comics journal to say like we really like this like keep going and we'll review it one day or something like that you know just any, like a, anything. And like a Sunday afternoon, I get this call and it's like hi, this is Gary Groth, and I and I was like uh, and I couldn't remember who that was for a minute. I was like and now I, I was like is like what, a bill collector or something. I was like confused and he was like we just got your comic and we thought it was great and we'd like to give you your own uh, monthly series. And it was like, I'm not, like, it was like jumping to the head of the line, you know, like I wasn't even at all, that wasn't in my thoughts in the slightest. And it was like, you don't have to do, pay any dues or anything, you just like, here you are, the keys to the kingdom. And so then, so then I had to like realize, I was like, of course, you know. And then I had to like figure out how the hell do you do a comic, you know, because I really, this is like the only comic I'd done since I was a teenager, really. So it was... Uh, that's where it all began. But I didn't, I didn't meet Gary and Kim probably for another year or two and, and was not at all disappointed. <laughs> Just, uh, <laughs> not at all. Anticlimactic. Right. You should. Uh, Jim, you, um, I believe, came in via Gilcane, and um, maybe you were hoping that you were going to get the job editing Honk. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's time. exactly right. <laughs> you're, li you're living in Los Angeles? Uh, yeah, I was living in Los Angeles. I was working at the world's lousiest animation studio, but Gil Kane worked there, and that redeemed it. And he and I became friends, and of course he was best friends with Gary, and Gary had was uh, putting out this magazine called, it was either Honk or Centrifugal Bumble Puppy, one of those. <laughs> And uh, he was looking for an editor, and so I auditioned for it by meeting him at a restaurant, and I brought this self-published sort of diary thing I had been working on that didn't have any comics in it, but it had a lot of solipsistic writing and pictures. And I showed it to him hoping that he would recognize my layout skills and my good printing and give me a job editing this magazine. And instead he said, well, you know, we're a comics publisher, so we can't publish this, but if you put some comics into it, we'd consider it. So I went home and became an opportunist and put the stuff together and showed it to them and they put it out and I think Jim Magazine lost money for years and years but they kept publishing it which I think uh, describes the essence of Fantagraphics. They were always about love over money. <clears throat> um, but um, Eric, you also describe the Fantagraphics, um, well, you, you call it the family. Um, often, and maybe for in your case, it's it's truly a family. Did, did you meet your wife Rhea at, at Fanographics? And um, um, I met my wife and most of my friends. Most of your friends, yeah. yeah. So, what, 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 how old were you when you first started working? I had older? turned uh, I had turned 21 like uh, like a couple days before I so showed you feel up like at your the doorstep. Adult life has been <laughs> spent. Yep. Yeah. And I turned 21, hopped in a car. And drove to Seattle like two days later. And How were you alerted of the opportunity there? Were you? I was working. Um, I was going to college in Southern California. I was an aspiring cartoonist and also a writer. And and um, I was the managing editor of the paper at the University of California, Irvine. And. Um, most of the other students who worked at the newspaper were all jostling for internships at various newspapers and 
it seemed very unappealing to me. It was like, you know, you'd have to go intern at the Sacramento Bee in the, you know, the sports pages or something. And I just, that seemed really daunting to me. And literally one day I went to the comic shop. I'm pretty sure I bought a copy of 8-Ball, uh, one of the early issues. Uh, I was a big fan of Fanagraphics, and I just thought, huh, wonder, wonder what, wonder if that could be something. And I called them up, and they said, yeah, sure, you want to intern here? Come on up. So I did. And I never left. That was the interning vetting process at the time. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a real rigorous uh, process. <laughs> it's also, um, I, I want to stick with the family um, metaphor a bit. But I, I think there's a story that you brought your young daughter to the offices one day when she was about 18 months old. And um, do you remember that story? Yeah, if it's the one I think you're thinking about. Uh, <laughs> it's the horrible one. The, the horrible one. No, it's, it's not the horrible one. <laughs> well, the office, uh, you know, I'd, I, it's, it'd be more, far more interesting to hear what these guys made of the office the first time they saw it. But basically, I was there with my, like, 18-month-old like daughter, and I brought her into the office, and we were in the front room, and there was shag carpeting in the room at the time. And... I uh, had to go grab something out of the printer, which was just in the next room over, and I was just like, you know, literally take me like 10 seconds, you know, to go get this, and so I was just like, all right, stay here, and I go, and I grab it, and I come back, and she's holding an X-Acto blade <laughs> <laughs> that I think she'd like picked up out of the carpet. <laughs> She, uh, she still loves going to the office. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember I, I was in the late 80s, early 90s. I was going out to Seattle a lot for various reasons and um, went by the, the offices um, a few times with... with Why are you laughing, John? <laughs> with um, Peter Bagg, who, who was living um, in, in the area and who's originally from New York and, and, and Westchester uh, County, where I'm from. Um, I, Joe, do you want to, did you, so Joe, you, you um, came in as, as a news editor for the Comics Journal in the, in the, in the mid 80s, um, um, long before you became um, the distinguished um, graphic novels that you are now. Um, did, did you have an, like an actual job interview? Um, <laughs> Do you have any thoughts about what the offices were like? The oh, I have thoughts about the offices. Um, I was looking at my own little magazine in Portland, Oregon, which folded after about 15 issues. And I had, uh, at one point, I'd gone to uh, California, and uh, when they were in California before they were in Seattle, and he sued, I think, Kim, Kim Thompson uh, for my publication. And uh, at some point, I called him up and I said, you know, we're folding, and you bought a year's worth of ads, so I just want to return the balance to you. And um, he said, you want a job? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was sort of it. Yeah. <laughs> so I went, I went uh, to work for them. Uh, they were in Gore Hills. Yeah, like I said, this is before Seattle, but uh, that was a nap house. <laughs> and there was also, uh, there was also a house, I think you were living in it. I never lived in that house, but there were a couple of people who did live in it. Bob Fiore lived in it. Yeah. I mean, you'd be in the office and people would be just getting out of bed and walking around in the bathrobes. Well, Kim especially. but It was fun. It was, it was a, a very funny time. Uh, sometimes there was so much noise, so much mayhem, that I would find a spare room and just go sit in there and do my work. And I remember there was one employee who had a pet rabbit. And she would like leave it, you know, uh, oh. on the carpet. And at some point she said, Oh, can you put, can you <coughs> keep that in the room if you are working? <laughs> and uh, about an hour later, I looked up, looked her, you know, over my shoulder, and there was a rabbit in 200 pallets. <laughs> wow. This thing was, uh, it was kind of crazy, actually. It was a little crazy. Well, it was especially than crazy exactly blades. back then. Yeah. <laughs> but it was fun, too. I mean, people like, uh, uh, <laughs> Kirby would stop by, Bill Kane would stop by, the bros would stop by, so it was, it, uh, it was a very organic place, uh, unlike many places I had worked before. So, uh, it's a polite way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it grew on you, 
<laughs> I mean, what, one, of the re one of the ways we could afford to exist is we worked out of houses. In fact, California for about three years, two, two and a half years or so is the, the, is the only location that we actually had to have a real office space, which I think you might not have worked in. But we had to move out of that house because of zoning regulations. Um, but we've always otherwise worked out of a house and that basically saved overhead. I mean, in Connecticut, when we, when we worked in Connecticut, um, it was a huge six bedroom house that we all lived in and worked in. We were in our 20s. And then in California, we just rented ha uh, houses. We rented two houses and then we had to move into an office just to save money because renting a house is a lot cheaper than renting office space. Um, and now in Seattle, we you know, have, a, have a house that's actually zoned commercial. Um, so we have the best of both worlds. But that's the, way, the reason we did that was to save money. But how are you saving money, though, in the, especially the Connecticut be, be, one? Because the, uh, the rent on, uh, the on, on a residential property is less than the rent on a, on a yeah. commercial property. Okay. And when we were young enough, we could actually live there. So I mean, if you have five people living in the house and working in the house, that's cheap. And you had roommates living there who had nothing Some, to do with the Sometimes. Company. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yes. And so, so what did what did they think of like the chaos? I, mean, you guys, I, I know your I have no idea. Your work it not, hours. It wasn't relevant to me what they thought. They just, <laughs> I have no idea what they thought. That's Gary right there. Yeah. <laughs> they rented a room, and you know, the less we saw them, the better. And they would just yeah. come in and go to the room. And yeah. A lot of love. <laughs> yeah, we rented a we, well. We rented a, a house in um, L.A., which you guys probably remember real well. And it was this big. It was a five-bedroom house, and it had this big room off the side. And um, we wanted to rent this large room that was off the uh, the garage. And so I rented it to a middle-aged woman um, who turned out to be Mickey Rooney's wife, and she had her liaisons there. So I'd be standing in the um, in the kitchen where there was a big window and just every few days I was here coming up the driveway with some new young stud and oh, Mickey Rooney had and nine go, Hi, Mrs. Rooney which and she would, which, wife? which wife? Well, it was, it was 80, um, <laughs> it was 84 oh, and 85, so whichever <laughs> wife he had then. Oh, Agnes. Agnes. Yeah. She was really nice. <laughs> yeah, and at the time, one of his sons was a, was a drummer for Oxnard punk bands. Wow. And when you told me that story, I was just like, you mean all I gotta do is go to, go to band practice and just say, hey, guess what? I saw your mom, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I would never. Can we just talk about Mickey Rooney for the next 20 minutes? The Rooney, <laughs> it's the Rooney connection. Does anyone in this, know who knows, <laughs> anyone in this room know who Mickey Rooney is? <laughs> Warren. <laughs> The kind of rabbit, I mean, the, the, the office environment at the time Joe worked there was a lot wilder at that period. And then we moved to Seattle, we slowly got a little more professional. Slowly. A little, you know. Although, although in 2010, I had been with them for years, and how you did it back then was you do some artwork, go to FedEx, ship it off, you know, there's no no uh, internet. So I just, they were an address to me. Something so, now southeast City. or Lake City Way. I don't know where that was. Northwest, right. So in 2010, I had to go to Fantagraphics for the first time and I was expecting this like office-y place or a where, cool warehouse. Yeah, something, I don't know. And it was like, you took me, Jim. And it was like, you, oh, have, yeah. you said, you mean you haven't been there yet? No. It was this like funky house and I walk in and the first thing I see is this waterfall cascade of Kim Thompson's papers falling out. His desk was piled up. Oh, yeah. Every <laughs> cabinet had papers. It was just like he sat here and it was papers, paper, 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 paper. Do you remember that? I do. Gosh, it's like how could you work? How could you find that. anything? How could you work? It's amazing. And yeah, shag carpeting with blades. There were beads in the windows. And yes. <clears throat> the kitchen was really a workspace. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was. 
I think Dan was terrified the first time he went to the office, maybe the only time. Uh -oh. Wait, you know, were you terrified? Yeah, I kind of was. I remember, <laughs> the, I remember when I did my second issue of Lloyd Llewellyn, and I sent it off to you guys. You, back then, as she said, you would just send the original art. I never Xeroxed it. I had no copies of it or anything. And I remember I went on a trip, and when I came back, there were all these messages from you on my answering machine, and you were like, Dan, you said you are going to send the issue. We don't have it. Where's the issue? And then you, I could tell you thought that I actually didn't do it, and that I had lied to you and said I had sent it, and you were really mad. And finally, I called you back, and you were like, yeah, so you never sent it. And you, were, you really were accusatory, and I was like, I swear to God, I sent it. And you were like, well, we never got it. And I'm like, well, I sent, I sent it by Federal Express, and, and you hung up. You know, I'll look into it, and then you called back later. Nope, we never got it. And I'm like, okay, that was like three months of my life, like just working, you know, 90 hours a week. I'll probably quit comics if that is actually lost. Like that would have been. And then, uh, and you go, well, read back to me the address you sent it to, and I, and I read it back to you, and you said, oh, well, we moved since then. I guess I never told you. <laughs> And so you went over to the old address, and it was just on the porch in the rain. It had been there the whole time. Are you making this up? I'm not. I'm not. And so if, that, if somebody had just taken that off the porch, people probably saw it like, oh, it's some comics. <laughs> and, but if somebody had taken that, I probably would have, you know, I'm going to be an architect now, I guess, or something. Wow. Well, you know, our 40th anniversary book is at the printer. We told you so. And it's an oral history of the company. And the funny thing is, it's filled with anecdotes like that that I have no <laughs> recollection of, but that I believe happened. You know, I just, I just have no recollection of things like that. But it's just, the, the whole book is filled with anecdotes like that, where, God, that really happened? And I'm sure it did. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I've skimmed through the book. It's, it's, it's fairly amazing. And, um, um, and, and it's, it's... It's funny, right? It's really funny. And... I, so I started writing for the Comics Journal um, in, I guess, the late 80s or early 90s. And I think my first assignment that you gave me was with, with Drew um, here because um, you had interviewed him and then forgot to hit record on the... Uh, <laughs> There's so many interviews. That so many times. Lost. And, um, um, and it's, 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 a, it's weird to, to read about this history um, in an actual book and everything where you might have had some sort of tangential um, <clears throat> experience with it. But um, it's, uh, it, it, it's, certainly, it's, certainly, it's certainly a good read and I um, encourage everybody uh, when, it, when it comes out that you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy it greatly. Um, Drew, you were telling me a story um, well, earlier about Sid Caesar? Well, I was just thinking. Well, you just ruined, you just, you just, you just, you just ruined the punchline, so I'm, I'm not going to ruin it. Sid Caesar. I was just, well, you ruined the punchline. Right? What can I say? Well, anyway, my favorite moment of uh, working with Fanographics, and I was indirectly involved. I put out a book that they published called Old Jewish Comedians, which was portraits of old Jewish comedians in their liver spots and whatnot. So Fanographics <laughs> sent out copies to some of the still living comedians, and one of them was Sid Caesar. So a couple of weeks later, Sid Caesar called Fanographics, and the secretary said, some old guy named Sid Caesar's on the phone, and, and he, sounds, he sounds angry. <laughs> so Kim Thompson, being a huge Sid Caesar fan, picked up, took the call, and Sid Caesar yelled and screamed at him for 20 minutes, just like calling him every filthy, every filthy Jewish name. He went into <laughs> Yiddish dialogue. He was so like livid about, because in the book we called uh, Sid Caesar, Isaac Sidney, Sidney Caesar, his real name. My wife Kathy and I researched their real names. That's the only text in the book. So he didn't want people to know his real name was Isaac. So he was screaming at Kim. So Kim called me and he was giddy. He was like, so it was like the greatest <laughs> moment of his publishing career, he told me. So, you know, it's, it's, in retrospect, that's one of my favorite things to think about, that Kim was so happy to be screamed at by Sid Caesar <laughs> for 20 minutes. Um, Want to hear my Jonathan Winters anecdote? Yeah, actually. <clears throat> So I'm, uh, I'm calling people to uh, write introductions to the complete peanuts. And we just, and we just picked 
you know, a variety of people, actors, musicians, uh, you know, playwrights, uh, you know, people I personally like, uh, whose work I like, people who I think might have some connection to uh, Charles Schultz or Peanuts. And Jonathan Winters is just one of the great comedic geniuses of the late 20th century, so, so I thought he might appreciate Peanuts. So I call him up, get his number somehow, and I call him up, and I say, Mr. Winters, you know, we're publishing uh, the complete Peanuts, and would you, um, could I, you know, could I talk you into writing an introduction to one of them? And without missing a beat, he says, no. <laughs> and I said, well, um, do you do not like the strip? And he says, oh, no, I like it really well. I, I love the strip. And, and so I'm like kind of puzzled by this. So, well, you know, can I ask you why you wouldn't be interested in, you know, in writing an introduction? And he said, well, in 19... 66, I had a book of paintings being published by a publisher in New York, and I visited um, the Peanuts Syndicate, and uh, I got in the elevator on the way down, and, and Charles Schultz got in the elevator with me, and I asked Charles Schultz if he would write an introduction to my book of paintings, <laughs> and, he, and he said no. <laughs> There's your introduction right there. Yeah, exactly. That's great. And to that, I had nothing to say. Like, yeah. That makes sense, okay. Don't call me, baby. <laughs> Trina, can you um, compare or contrast um, how working for, doing work for um, books for Fantagraphics is or was to um, the other earlier all underground um, publishers? Well, it depends on which underground publishers. The fact is that um, the publishers have always been nice to me. I mean, in the very early 1970s, days of the underground, it was such a boys' club. And the, you know, the guys, I mean, basically I was shut out. I was not invited into their club. But the publishers were fine. They always published me the print mint. Don Schenker, Bob Rita, Ron Turner, God bless him, who was the first guy to publish uh, an all-woman comic, It Ain't Me Babe, and then later published Women's. Uh, the publishers were always nice to me. So I can't, I can't say he was better. Sorry about that. No. They were all very nice to me. I'm just looking, for the, the wrong question I'm just looking for the truth. <laughs> um, Joe, when you um, were writing the news stories for the Comics Journal, do, do, you, um, do you have any, you remember any that stand out in particular that were, um, I mean, it, running, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to imagine if, if, if people weren't reading um, that magazine at the time, there really wasn't anything like it. There, it, was, it was taking comics as a serious art form and it was hard hitting, um, real in depth, Reporting um, being done in in a medium that was, you know, was was said earlier was there was just a lot of regurgitation of press releases and fluff pieces and and um, this was a completely different approach to it and it was the it was reading that magazine um, around the period of time when you when you first started working there is, is when I started reading it and, and I said. This is this is the place that I want to write for. You know, I don't I don't want to write for I didn't even want to write for the New York Times. I wanted to write um, for for this publication. And I you know, thankfully that happened. I've been writing f for the for the Comics Journal for the last 25 years or so, um, and um, I'm incredibly proud of the stuff that I've did for that. But do you um, getting back to my question. Um, do you have any pieces that um, stand out for you, or, or that sort of maybe um, had an impact on what you would go on later with your own comics journalism? You the, know, the in, lawsuits. In graphic. Were, you know, the lawsuit the thing lawsuits. you did was pretty good. The lawsuits, lawsuits were always. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what's interesting is um, for me it was I, I graduated from journalism school and I had a few journalism jobs that were really sort of disheartening for me. I mean, they weren't the kinds of things I wanted to do at all. And then it was through the comics journal that I actually began to write hard news. And that's what I wanted, originally that's what I wanted to do. I mean, maybe I, would, maybe I could become a cartoonist if I was writing hard news, uh, that was uh, where it was at for me. And it was mainly the lawsuits, and you were involved in a number of lawsuits. And what's interesting about that, what really stands out to me, is how it, you kind of shrugging your shoulders. And I mean, you were, there were lawsuits of millions of dollars. 
And uh, in the office, he'd never know it from uh, the way Gary and Kim and sort of took it. They'd be like, okay, you've got to fly somewhere to a position, or this is happening, or that's happening. So it was totally stride. The magazine was so hated by um, a certain contingent of mainstream comics creators and others that there was a period where we were sued three times and we were fighting three lawsuits at the same time. It was a total of over four, like four and a half million dollars that they were suing us for. Um, and one of the lawsuits went on for seven years, yeah, seven years. And we finally went to trial in 1987 and then Joe wrote, I think you wrote a story, um, you actually called up the jury members to find, to, oh, yeah. to, to find see. Why they, why they, uh, uh, <laughs> why they ruled the way they did. And it was sort of surprising. The one I remember the most was uh, some jury member, he didn't believe a witness because the witness was asked, well, was that before or after Easter? And this, this, this uh, witness couldn't figure out what Easter was. That was the reason he ruled in your favor. <laughs> 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 Gary, who sued you besides Michael Fleischer? Uh, well, the publisher of the Buyer's Guide, who I previously said how much we hated. Um, <laughs> Alan Light. Uh, Alan Light. Oh. Uh, that was your first, your first issue of you attacked him from, yes, you, from the, the very get-go. Yeah, the first issue I, yeah, first issue I wrote like a 10,000 word essay <laughs> about the buyer's guide. <laughs> and, but he didn't sue over that. He sued when he sold the buyer's guide to another publisher, to a uh, publisher in Wisconsin. And um, I wrote a kind of farewell editorial. Um, I remember accusing him of uh, uh, shoddy journalism and um, perpetuating, quote, spiritual squalor. <laughs> over the last 10 years, and he sued me for $2 million. And we had to fly to, we had to, fly to um, God, somewhere in the Midwest to, uh, for depositions on that. So it was Michael Fleischer, who was a comic book writer at the time, and uh, Rich Buckler, who was oh, a, an was artist. What was that about? You call Fleischer back? Yes, we, we, we interviewed the science fiction author Harlan Ellison, and he accused Fleischer of being crazy as a bed bug. <laughs> Certifiable. Certifiable. Well, he went on and on and on about it, and, and, the, and the, writer, the writer contended that we um, literally accused him of being clinically insane, and so he sued us on those grounds, and that, and that lasted seven years. I mean, he would just not stop, and that culminated in a jury trial in Federal District Court in New York. Um, and Rich Buckler sued us because we uh, ran an article where we accused him of plagiarism. So we had a 48 point headline across two pages accusing him of plagiarism, uh, where we printed the drawings that he did and then the drawings by Jack Kirby that he oh, swiped wow. side by side. Across. How could he sue? Well, you can sue anybody for anything, <laughs> at any time. And, um, but he did drop the lawsuit after um, two days of deposing him. Well, we could do this um, for hours, but um, we, we actually can't. So um, um, anyone have any questions from the audience? Uh, let me think. There's Warren down there. Yeah, I, now that I have both. There's a mic over the thing. Oh. <laughs> Warren, what are you doing? Mr. Jesus. Yeah, do the program. Please, Running Warren. Um, I, I want to uh, ask Joe and Gary about uh, Palestine, OK, because that, that whole thing in many ways it was revolutionary, but it was a big risk. It took a lot of time. How did that all come about? Because you know, all of a sudden, you've got one of your creators living in the Gaza Strip, all right, and all of the uncertainty that goes with that, and how, you know, just how did you work on all of that, and how did you figure all that out and continue with the way you did because of just the precariousness of what was going on? They just got an insurance policy. <laughs> really? Yeah. No. Then, <laughs> <laughs> no, we did. Wow. Uh, I was living in Berlin at the time, and uh, I went there, uh, did my research, and I came back to how I remember it. And then I was at a party in Seattle uh, with you and Kim and a bunch of other cartoonists, and I mentioned what I had done. And I really, I wasn't sure I couldn't imagine I was really going to fly in a way, and instantly you, you said you'd print it. I mean, and to me that was a very loaded subject, and I mean, a comic about Palestine just seems kind of 
Right. Now you use my years now. But you, you went with it right away. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it kept selling less and less each, uh, each issue that came out. So by the last issue, I think it was selling like 1,800. Yeah, that sounds and right. And they didn't cancel it. I mean, they let the whole thing run its course. They're which, much uh, in my account. That's all I remember. No, I think that's right. I think I mean I don't specifically remember that, but I mean it sounds like exactly the kind of comic that we would want to publish and that I would want to encourage you to do. And I mean, it's, it, yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to. I'm trying to reconstruct that in my memory. But if you suggested doing a you know a comic about of journalism about what was going on in Israel, that just seemed like the kind of thing it's exactly like what we wanted to do, like the direction we wanted to push comics in. I couldn't imagine, you know, being anything but supportive or something like that. And, and yeah, and yeah, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the comics market, which was really the only market at that time, was just, if not outright hostile to it, just completely indifferent to it. And, and actually, on, on that point, did, did you run into controversies given the given the topics and what was being dealt with within the comic? Not really. Well, no, that's not. That's not would have thought. Every now and then some books, uh, some comic book store wouldn't take it. And every now and then someone suggested it was anti-Semitic, it was in the store, and then they pulled it. But it really wasn't, I didn't feel that sort of hostility. I mean, actually the great thing was it flew so low under the radar that no one paid attention. And so it could really, I could really get my own voice. And, and then the, I know that you then put them in compendiums. It's still in print to this day, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's, in, it's one of our best-selling books, yeah. Now, now. Yeah, and, and it shows just the, the stick to in terms of what FANA does with a lot of their stuff. Oh, yeah, so I wanted to... Love <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so Another question? Uh, yeah, uh, I was just wondering if the panel had any comments on the uh, state of comics journalism today. I'm sorry? The state of comics sorry. journalism today. Uh, non-existent. <laughs> I mean, there really isn't much journal. I mean, I don't really see much of actual journalism. I mean, there's a lot of reviewing going on, but I don't really see any journalism. I mean, what we did was real, I mean, investigative journalism. I mean, it's, you know, um, I mean, if something would happen, uh, companies wouldn't pay artists, which happened frequently throughout the 80s and 90s. And uh, I mean, it's a little probably less so today, but I mean, there, there were always shady things going on, um, you know, especially in those, you know, early, you know, couple of decades of the direct sales market and independent publishing. There were just all kinds of shady things going on. And there might very well be today, but nobody knows about it. But we would do, we would do really hardcore, serious investigative journalism where we would dig deeply into stories. Um, you know, Eric was, um, started off as a news writer for the Comics Journal, and, um, you know, he broke one of the great stories in the, in the 90s, um, when uh, all the distributors were collapsing in the 90s, which left Diamond as the monopoly distributor in the comics market. Um, so I don't see any of that happening today on the internet, you know, with, with the vastness of the internet, I see none of that. But, I mean, every issue, we would have, you know, serious investigative pieces. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, it's an honor, and um, see you.